Good morning. morning. Hey, if if you've not been here before, howdy. Howdy. Welcome to Country Fellowship. We're glad to see so many of you here. Uh, It is Labor Day, and it's kind of a a fun day for us. I'm going to use that, James. There we are. Uh, And if we've not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I'm the teaching pastor here, and if you've been coming for a while, you know that already. And you know that now the part of our worship comes where we open God's Word, and we ask Him to speak to us. Uh, but I will tell you something, that, that the worship that you lead us into, Sammy and team, makes me want to be a, a better at what I do, and, and I really appreciate that. So on behalf of all of us, let's just give you one more. Uh, it's a lot of fun being a part of that. So today we're going to continue in our study in the Gospel of Luke and in chapter 6, and particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. And so before we open God's word and ask him to teach us, let me ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, my ideas are really worthless. It's your ideas that count and that change life and are transformative and timeless. So we open your word now with the expectation that you will be our teacher, that you will mold us and shape us, that in the end we will look more like your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, we've talked about it and saying it's like a yardstick by which you can measure your own soul. And, you know, last week that was really particularly hard as we talked about loving our enemies. And I have to just confess, this, this whole series just makes me feel like I need to just go back and, and do some of these and start over. But I think that's part of what the intent is. I, th- I think this is... Uh, the the way this is supposed to work a little bit is for, to motivate us to be better and to point out and to occasionally say, how are you doing on this? And, <laughs> and know that God loves us. But as we get into this today, we're going to move uh, through a, a couple of verses today that are also challenging, but maybe a little bit lighter for us uh, as we study them. So let me start here in uh, chapter 6, verse 37. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 6, verse 37 And it goes like this. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And this is a really interesting thing. It comes in a section, as we've kind of broken this down. There's the first section of this, which was verses 20 through 26, which said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. To summarize, blessed are those of you who are put in a situation where you know you need God. And I'm going to just, I don't want to be too personal. Bruce, we are with you, and we are all praying for you. Brother, Blessed are you because of the knowledge that you need God and surrounding you is your church and your people. Amen? Amen. All right? And and something is going to, a miracle will happen here somewhere in all of this. Because blessed are those who know they need the Lord. And this is wonderful. And then we get into the second part of the Sermon on the Mount, which tells us the tough things, raising the bar on how we interact with each other. A little bit. Loving your enemies was really hard. And now we've got a couple of difficult things to do. And it comes to us in in an interesting format. Two don'ts and two do's. Right? Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. And then do forgive, and you will be forgiven. And do give, and it will be given to you. And what I'm going to suggest is that these verses kind of along with the ones we studied last week about loving your enemies, they all work together as kind of a, a raising the bar on your performance in human interaction with each other. And before we were told that in response to evil, you respond with kindness. And this is where the two don'ts kind of end up putting the capstone on that teaching. You may be punched, hit, struck, attacked verbally, 
don't respond with anything but kindness. Okay? And then we're going to ease into a different kind of teaching this week, which says maybe you get to initiate with somebody else. And when you get to start the interaction with another person, start with kindness. And that's what we're going to see. But these verses are often misunderstood. And I'm just going to tell you a couple of things here. <laughs> this verse here is probably the most quoted by non-Christians against Christians. Hey, what happened to don't judge? Right? They'll tell you. And that's embarrassing when a pagan quotes the Lord to you, isn't it? <laughs> it? It is to me. And so part of this is let's make sure we understand because it is a, it's a fair question to ask. I work with a lot of young people in a Christian school, and they ask, hey, when are we supposed to judge and when are we supposed to not judge? And I'll tell you, there's really, I think, a very simple biblical rule for this that fits with the entire Bible. And let me see if I can throw it out to you. Judge ideas. Don't judge people. Does that make sense? We must judge ideas. You know, 2 plus 2 is 4, and any suggestion that it's not, we can say, that's wrong. Right? And we are put in a position where we are asked to discern ideas. But nowhere in the Bible are we told that it is our job to judge people. As a matter of fact, we're told throughout the Bible, many verses, many places, we don't know enough to judge people. Does that make sense? So let's just say, judge ideas, but not people. Okay? Now, one of the reasons that I know this, and I'm going to throw out a few verses, if you want to write them down, that's great. Is just not much later, a few verses from now, Jesus is going to say in verse 44, he's going to say, each tree is recognized by its fruit. And in Matthew's version of that, he said, you may judge a tree by its fruit. So the whole idea is you must be discerning. You can be discerning. You have to judge ideas. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are true or some of them are false, but you must not judge people. A couple of other verses that came up here. One is in John chapter 7, verses 24. Jesus says, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. That's John 7, 24. The Lord commands us to make a correct judgment. So nowhere does it say that you shouldn't judge anything. It says you shouldn't judge people. And here's a great verse. Maybe this is the best one for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. That helps us with this idea. It says, the spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Did you catch that? The spiritual man makes judgment about all things. Ideas are open game for judgment. We must be discerning about ideas. But we are not subject to the judgment of any man. Our judge will be Jesus Christ. And we should not judge any man. Does that make sense? I think that's the perfect rubric by which we, we can go through and we can understand where do we not judge, etc. One of the reasons that we don't judge other people is, first of all, that's, God has declared, that's my territory, I'll do that. You don't need to do that, I'll take care of that. But there's also a good reason for it. Logically, we don't know enough. We really just simply don't know enough, right? Um, when we were... <laughs> My wife, when we were young, we tried to teach our little kids when they were young, I guess. Uh, people are more important than things, right? We can judge things, we can be mad at things, we can get new things, but people are more important than that. I don't know how well that teaching took. We're still kind of, uh, we're still kind of praying to see some of that give fruit, right? But, but I, I believe that's accurate, and I think that's consistent with the biblical teaching. Here's a, a couple of reasons. 1 Samuel 16, when Samuel's going to anoint King David, and the Lord tells him, you know, no, all of Saul's sons that you're seeing, they're not, they're not the, the, the right ones. This is the one. And he says, the Lord does not look on the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the, the heart. The Lord can see into things that you and I can't. We see outward appearances. The Lord sees things we can't. You know, here's a good thing. Uh, I found this one. I was looking for this in 1 Kings chapter 8. This is Solomon's prayer to God to dedicate the temple after it's, the first temple was constructed. And by the way, if you're looking for something to do in a Bible study, that whole prayer is, is really good, rich, chock full, chunky theological stuff there, okay? And in verse 39, Solomon says to the Lord, deal with everyone according to all they do since you know their hearts. You alone know every human heart. So we can't. We can't. 
Paul says this really well too. In Corinthians, and I'll, I'll just 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5, I care very little if I'm judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Now this strikes from, he is so adamant against judging people, he won't even judge himself. Is, is that interesting? Do you judge yourself? Are you the harshest judge of yourself? Have you thought about that? That's interesting. Paul extrapolates this theology to the forgiveness of self, even, which is interesting. But he goes on to say, my, my conscience is clear, but it does not make me innocent. Uh, in other words, the, the Lord has cleared and forgiven my conscience. It doesn't mean that I'm innocent. It is the Lord who judges me, right? Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. So we judge ideas, not people. Amen? Okay, and one of the most well-established biblical things here, but it's hard to separate people from ideas sometimes. I think that's where I struggle the most. <laughs> when, I, when I first began teaching, an older lady who'd been a retired principal was well, helping us in the Christian schools. She gave me some great advice. She really did. And, and a lot of it, you know, she was the one who first told me, you know, they're not going to care what you know until they know that you care. And that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And she said, you have to create an open environment where the kids can ask you any question safely without feeling like it was a dumb question. And she said, Albert Einstein once said, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. And after a semester of teaching teenagers algebra, <laughs> I wanted to add a corollary to that, which is Albert Einstein never met, and I had three names. You're laughing because I'm telling you, there, the, wait a minute, that was actually a stupid question. <laughs> that really was. I think by every criteria, even the Lord would say, yeah, that was kind of a dumb question. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, it's funny. I, I looked into this a little bit. I said, wow, did Einstein really say that? Actually, he didn't. Even though I do, I, I do believe in that principle that, that when you're working with young people, you need to create an environment where they're encouraged to explore without you, you know, stomping them flat every time they do. That doesn't mean they don't ask dumb questions, though. I can assure you that. I have evidence to the contrary. But I believe in creating that encouragement. Einstein never said that. The source of that quote is really kind of undetermined, and even though I believe in it as a principle, what Einstein said is a little bit more consistent with my experience. He said, quote, two things are, uh, are infinite. The universe and human stupidity and come to think of it, I'm not so sure about the universe. <laughs> That's my kind of guy. <laughs> right? P.T. Barnum said nobody ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American populace. So it is hard for me to separate people from ideas. And maybe you know what I'm talking about. Right? If we all decided, hey, you know what, we've got a big long weekend, let's do something together, and somebody were to raise their hand and go, let's go camping, right? That's a bad idea to me. No, let's go to an air-conditioned place where we can watch sports would be my idea, right? But you understand that, that in a loving environment, we, don't, we, don't, we wouldn't suggest that that person was evil. We might, if it was hot enough, we might, actually. But we, we tend to do that politically, don't we? When someone brings up an idea that's contrary to what we think should be done, boy, it's easy to demonize them. A amen? And this is where we have got to take the lead here and separate the idea from the person. And I have, I am, you know, you know I'm not the greatest at this, right? I, sometimes I'm a better talker about this than I am an exemplar. And these, this is hard for me. In other words, I'm not sure you should follow my example here. But I did find somebody this last week who did a great job of respecting the human being when he was asked a really dumb question. It's Admiral Robert Willard. In 2010, there was a congressional hearing. Uh, the House of Representatives had the House Armed Services Committee. It's, if you've ever seen it, it's like a ring of representatives, and it's focused in on asking this one guy. And he was being questioned by a particular congressman, and I won't tell you who, you could probably find out, but in the spirit of, of being loving and, and respecting that person, I don't want to name that person. I really don't. But this congressman asked him, uh, uh, was questioning him about the, the Navy's plans to move 8,000 Marines from Okinawa, because of it was overcrowded, to Guam. 
And he actually asked, he said, you know, aren't you worried that all these Marines and their families might cause the island to tip over and capsize? <laughs> this is, and you can find this, this is straight up. I, I, yeah, I mean, some of you are laughing, right? Islands, they're not floating, right? It, the temptation for me to respond to that question and my, my instinctive training as a stand-up comedian would have, it would have kicked in and something other than Jesus would have come out, Right? I mean, I mean, I think I fantasize about how I might have responded to that. That's, that's such a dumb question. It's like teeing it up for me. Here, would you? You know what Admiral Willard did? He did something I'd like to be better at. He respected this person, responded to the question. And I, 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 you can watch, after a moment of hesitation, without, without giving any sign whatsoever that he found the question stupid, he said, sir, we don't anticipate that problem. And that's all he said. And, and I, I kept thinking, that man is more Jesus than me because I don't know that I could have done that. Can you do that when someone, when someone brings up an idea like going camping in the middle of July? <laughs> Separating the idea which we are commanded to judge from the person that we're not commanded, that we're commanded not to judge is a simple but hard task, like much of the Sermon on the Mount. But there's another thing about this that, that has kind of gnawed at me all week. And that this, this section of Scripture says, do not judge, and you won't be judged. Judged by who? <laughs> you know, I have to confess to you that I was taught that this meant don't judge, and you will not be judged by God. And I think that's wrong. And I, I'm going to tell you that I was, I was definitely taught that way. I was taught, don't judge and you won't be judged by God. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned by God. Forgive others and you will be forgiven by God. Give to others and God will give to you. And I don't think that's right. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I don't want to confront anybody. I'm not trying to pick a fight. right? But I, I think given what we know from all of the other scriptures and the context of this verse in how it's dealing with human interaction, I don't think that's the right way to think about that. I, I don't think that's correct. And, and it, it's half right, right? The, the command to not judge is right, but it's the motivation that's wrong. And, and you know, we see that. We see that there's an implicit uh, reciprocity here. The Latin has a phrase, quid pro quo, which maybe you've heard of. And it means getting something for giving something. Get something for something is the literal translation of quid pro quo, meaning if I give, I can count on getting something back. And God, I assure you, does not work that way. We've all seen these churches, and again, I don't want to judge the people, but the idea is totally unbiblical that if you give $100, God is somehow obligated to give you back $100 or some multiple thereof. That is not true. That is not the God of the Bible. By the way, if you have $100 and you want to part with it, we've got a place you can put it. But I make you no promise that the Lord will multiply that and pour it into the... That I don't believe that's what happens. I do think there are verses that says your trust in God will be uh, rewarded. I, I think there are verses there, but that's a hard issue. The idea that you could rub the lamp and the genie will come out by writing a check without even thinking about what it's for... It's foolish, it's not the God of the Bible, and we see this heretical churches all over the place doing that, and it's sad. I think also the sovereignty of God dictates to us. At one point, he says to Moses, I'll be merciful to whom I will be merciful. There's no human action that will oblige God. I'm sorry, that's, that's all throughout Scripture. So if we go back and we look at this, well, what could this mean? And I think it applies, like all of the rest of the verses here, towards our interactions with others. Now, I want to just read to you where, where we started this section in verse 27 and listen to the tone. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And, and I'm emphasizing the fact that the object of this teaching is our interaction with other people. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him, the other also. Do you get the point? That we're in a section of teaching where God's giving us a little human interaction seminar. Right? And that's what's going on. 
He goes on to say, give to everyone who asks. If anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you, right? If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting them to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. and You will be sons of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father was merciful. And doesn't it make sense to just flow right into Don't judge people, and you won't be judged by them in return. Don't condemn people, and you won't be condemned by them in return. Forgive people, and you will be also forgiven by other people. Give to people, and other people will give to you. And I I believe that is the context of this teaching. And this last part about giving to other people, Jesus says they will give it back to you. Uh, A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. And this is a metaphor, you know, if you've ever, like, uh, put a cup of flour or something into a recipe, you know, you dip the cup in, you kind of pound it down a little bit, and then sometimes we use a knife to get a perfect level cup of that. This is a measure of the idea that we're going to tap that thing down, and then we're going to press it down. And we're going to keep filling it. And then once it's level, that's not even enough. We're going to fill it until it's overflowing. Right? It's a good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And this is what will come back to us. And by the way, occasionally, it's healthy to look at some what other versions of this say. The King James Version and the Revised King James that came out in 2000, uh, and a few other versions of this, put in a language that has been kind of cut out of other modern versions. For hundreds of years, the church heard this verse this way. I'm reading from the Revised King James in verse 38, uh, Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over, shall men pour into your lap. Do you hear it? Once again, for hundreds of years, the church did not think that God would do this, but other people would. And I think that's the original intent of this verse. But the idea, have you ever noticed that sometimes when you give something, you get so much more in return? I think that's the axiom here. You know what's funny, though? In talking to people, I don't think sometimes we notice when we give a little and people give us a lot. I think what you might be able to notice at times when someone has given you just a little and earned great loyalty from you in that process. And if we had time to gather and and testify, I think there would be cases of to places like restaurants that you've gone to because someone was good to you there. Um, you know, there's a story in our family of a grocer who delivered groceries to my mom when dad was out of town and she had two little babies. And I can tell you, for the next 15 to 20 years, my mom drove across town because that kindness was being returned, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. Do you have stories like that where a doctor has done something to earn your loyalty and you pay it back so many times. This is Jesus saying this is axiomatic. It's probably easier for, notice, for you to notice the times that that influenced your heart than all the times when you've done that to somebody else. But it's true. Now he ends this section at the end of verse 38 with this challenge. <laughs> for the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And the reason I say that's a challenge is because remember that we heard earlier in this the idea of do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and we called that the golden rule. And he's restating that again here. Use a measure that you would like to use used to you. And what I want you to hear in there, remember, the the Sermon on the Mount is a measuring rod by which we compare our soul to the standards of God. And if you do that and you think you're doing okay, you didn't do it right. (laughs) Sorry. Right? And one of the things he says is, hear it this way. Are you willing to give in the same measure that you want to receive? Huh? Hold yourself up to that. Are you willing to give to others in the same way that you want to receive? And when we put this all together, 
the teaching from verse 27 all the way through, what we get is a beautiful seminar on human interaction and, and a way that Jesus is explaining that this works for I hope you can hear all this together. And what he's telling us is, you know, the world works on a quid pro quo basis. You give me something, I give you something. Others love only those that are loving to them. But you can be different because you, you are a new creation. You have a totally different spiritual lineage and you can follow your Father in heaven. You can actually turn that around. Instead of stimulus and response, you can choose your response. When someone punches you, you can respond with kindness. When someone is unloving to you, you can respond with love. You can break that cycle that the rest of this world is trapped in because you have a power from heaven. And today's teaching is, and in some cases, you get to be the initiator. Perhaps no one has been evil to you and you meet someone for the first time. You get to start with kindness. And what you find is, because of what we know from the last, they will respond with kindness back. Hmm? And moreover, when you try a little kindness, when you start that way, (laughs) the response sometimes that you'll evoke will be returned in great measure. Hmm? Does that make sense? Do you see it? Do you see the, the beauty of all this teaching? It's, you know what? Whatever happens to you, you respond with kindness. Because that is what's going to be inside of you. That's what your Heavenly Father would do. And this is the thing. There are books and seminars that talk about how to lubricate the process of human interaction. And sometimes they're manipulative. You know, how to win friends and influence people and things like that. And the whole idea is use these techniques and you'll get what you want. And and Jesus is saying, no, no, no. This is not going to happen because you're manipulative. By the way, these principles are right, but they'll happen because they will naturally flow out of you because that's what's in you. When the Holy Spirit fills you with love and kindness, like a tube of toothpaste, when the world squeezes it, that's what comes out. Beat me long enough and I will curse because of the evil that remains in my heart. But in response to beating and torture, and crucifixion. When the world squeezed our Lord, do you know what came out? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's be more like that. Let's be filled with the Holy Spirit so when the world squeezes us with floods, with cancer, with whatever, we respond in kindness because that's what's in us. Father, we give you thanks and praise. We ask you to make us more like your Son, who had no evil inside him to respond. We ask you, Father, take that away from us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that when pressed, kindness and love comes out of us naturally, not to manipulate, not for our own gain, but for your gain and for your glory, and that they may notice that our Father is you and that that would bring you glory and that all men would know that there is a God and his name is Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.